Hey, I'm Bart Massey, uh, and this is CS410P510 Computer Sound and Music. Welcome to today's lecture, where we'll talk a little bit about sound as found in nature, because before we can talk about internal representations inside a computer, we need to go through some steps first. I hope everybody's safe and well. Let's dive into this material. So, um, you know, when we're talking about natural sound, probably the, a good place to start is to think about noise. And we'll have a more detailed discussion of noise later in this course, but it's important at the very beginning that we sort of know what noise is because it's a very common kind of sound and one that we think about a lot as we're dealing with audio. And noise is found everywhere in nature. Um, so let's talk a little bit about noise. Noise can be thought of, we talked before about sound being sort of thought of notionally as frequencies, well, noise can be thought of as sort of a jumble of frequencies uh, that are all sort of present at the same time. And so when we're thinking about noise, maybe a good place to start is with the wind. If you hear that rushing sound when wind is going by, that's a pretty classic example of nearly white noise. It's just a television static, stuff like that. And um, the thing about noise is that normally when we think about frequencies and sound and tones, right, we think about repeating signals. And most of what we'll talk about in this course is repeating signals. And noise sort of by definition, it isn't something that's ugly or hard to listen to. Technically, what we say is that a noise is a non-repeating signal uh, characterized by statistical randomness. So if you actually measured the sound pressure in a noisy environment, you'd see it sort of fluctuating randomly. And that is noise. Um, so there's really no characteristic frequency or tone at all. You sort of can think about it as containing sort of randomly varying components of every frequency if you want to. If you lo look at noise in the frequency domain, hey, it looks like noise there too, which is kind of a really interesting idea. But of course, the world would be boring if everything's noise. So probably the other kind of simple sound that you'll hear a lot of in nature is the impulse noise. So we've played a little bit in the last in-person lecture with claps and gunshots. When I, when I clap my hands, um, a single pressure wave sort of propagates outward, decaying as it goes because it gets spread out, sort of the different frequencies get spread out by the physics of the air. But initially it's sort of an impulse has sort of all possible frequencies in it at the same time. And uh, so there again, there's no sort of characteristic tone of a clap. They all kind of sound alike. Uh, the impulse noise, obviously, the basis of percussion, all that percussion is, is sort of a, you know, some rhythmic set of impulses, maybe modulated. Uh, and, uh, you know, once you want to think about tones, well, where do tones come from in nature? Tones mostly come from vibrating. Um, the obvious example is a string or a reed which will vibrate in response to an impulse or to a noise. Let me grab my guitar real fast. Uh, you know, a guitar has a string, has six strings, but each of those strings sort of vibrates in uh, when I excite it with an impulse. And, um, you know, once it starts vibrating, it produces a characteristic tone. And the different strings obviously produce different tones. And that's the um, sort of how a guitar works. The, uh, the um, if you listen to a guitar string, it doesn't sound very much like a sine wave. A guitar string pretty clearly has more going on than a simple sinusoidal vibration. And in fact, what it typically has, like most vibrating sounds typically have, is sort of 
a fundamental frequency and then at twice that frequency there'll be another sine wave interacting and at three times and at four times etc all with decreasing amplitude so as you go down the you know as you go left to right it goes down the um, spectrum and <coughs> so those harmonics which are due to nonlinearities floating around in the system typically are sort of very important to what a thing actually sounds like it's what makes a guitar note and a piano note sound different is that their harmonic content is different that's a big part of it and you know reeds vibrating reeds um the same thing so your woodwinds you know in uh you know those are classic tonal sounds that you find sort of in nature or in instruments produced uh, whistles are vibration um you know it's interesting to think of springs of strings as sort of classic differential equation stuff so anytime you take physics you're going to look at what's called a spring mass system um and the spring mass system is going to have uh <coughs> excuse me is going to have um sort of this idea that you know if you pull a thing that's on a, a mass that's on a spring it's going to shake back and forth trying to be at the characteristic length of the spring and it will either succeed or fail in doing that and sort of if you start doing the classical mechanics you sort of write down force equals over time equals mass times acceleration and that gives you this sort of equation um where k here is the spring constant of the material it's how stiff the spring is and m is sort of the notional mass of this system and this is a differential equation. It's a second order ordinary differential equation. So we der derive x of t, x is a function of t here. We derive x of t twice, we differentiate it twice, and that should be equal to minus um, x. So if you start exploring solutions to that ordinary differential equation, this is a very, very classic, well-studied differential equation in physics and in acoustics and you find out that the solution looks like cosine waves and of course cosine waves and sine waves are the same thing they're just different phase and so uh the solution here is some amplitude any amplitude times the cosine of uh, the square root of k over m times t and um you can sort of see that if you plug that back in if you differentiate on the left twice you get you know by the chain rule you get k over m times a and then times this whole thing because or sorry and minus because the derivative of cosine is minus sine the derivative of minus sine is minus cosine and so now you have that on the left and then on the right well there we go we've got um sort of minus k times the same thing and the k over m here the m's cancel and so sure enough this differential equation is solved that's how you solve the differential equation is by making sure that both sides of it agree and the funny thing here is that the amplitude is arbitrary it doesn't tell you how large it would be and sort of the actual amplitude is determined by sort of the excitation of the system so for a guitar string pretty clearly uh you know if i pluck it harder it produces a louder sound than if i pluck it softer and uh the you know for a wind instrument you know for a clarinet the harder i blow into it the louder it's going to be and um you'll sort of notice that for an impulse based thing where the excitations all at the beginning, you know, damping happens and that sound fades out. But for a guitar, it can take a really long time. If I play this high string of the guitar for this sort of mediocre acoustic guitar, you know, it's still pretty loud a couple seconds later, um, which is an important part of playing guitar is getting used to that idea. So that's uh, sort of tone production. But an equally important idea is the idea of resonance. Um, almost always in nature, tones are not produced by uh, just pure tone generators. They're almost always modified by some sort of resonant cavity. And in fact, a resonant cavity itself is a thing that um, 
can be used with a noise source to produce sound. A whistle or a flute are examples of sort of a resonant cavity together with a noise source. You blow over the the um, flute's uh, thing. What do they call the thing on a flute? Anyway, you blow over the hole in the front of the flute and it makes noise which then resonates inside the flute and that's why a flute makes a tone um <coughs> if you go look at the wikipedia page excuse me i got all coughed today if you go look at the wikipedia page for this stuff you'll see sort of for a whole bunch of different kinds of resonant cavity sort of how does it work um how is how, how does pressure so a resonant cavity works because the pressure in a restricted space, right, is going to build up sort of along the walls to sort of force air in toward the center. <coughs> and that's going to be selective. That's going to happen at half multiples of the fundamental frequency of the cavity. And so probably the easiest thing is to look at a thing that's open at both ends. This is about as simple a system as you can get. And um, if you have some length, characteristic length for the tube, and uh, you have some velocity, of, which is the speed of sound, then for every N, one, two, three, et cetera, you get that frequency out. And uh, it turns out that the volumes as you go up in frequency go down. And um, so there's, some kind of uh, thing that happens there. And, you know, cavities that are closed at one end. So a flute's open at, you know, one end. The uh, uh, guitar resonator, right, is this big part of the guitar right here. This is the resonator. And there's a hole that lets air in, and it resonates around in here at various pressures, and then comes out. And the characteristic shape of an acoustic guitar is you know, determine if you just bump it, right, an impulse noise, then I'll hold the string so they don't, right, you can hear that that cavity has sort of an echo, and that echo is the sort of the resonance of the thing, and that interacts strongly with the string. Without that resonator, a guitar isn't going to sound nearly as good, and so we have to pay attention to resonance. It's a big deal. Um... So we got resonators, we've got uh, you know noise sources, we got impulse sources, we got sound sources, and you know the the thing is that we typically what we do is we take these natural sounds and build what are called acoustic instruments, instruments that work without any electronics or any uh, computers or anything like that. They just work with these principles, and it's basically all variations on the same thing for a wind instrument you know for a trumpet for example you buzz your lips can't do it very well i'm not a trumpet player there i used to play trombone and that makes a noise uh sort of a series of impulses pretty much with some noise in it and that excites the resonant cavity in your trombone or trumpet and that's why you get a trombone or trumpet tone out i didn't get out my trombone to try it out but trust me on this one for a flute <coughs> excuse me like i say it's you know blowing noise noise into a resonant cavity and that tone comes completely from the frequencies that are resonated with amplified by that cavity for a reed instrument like a clarinet or a saxophone you know that that buzzing of the reed or or oscillating of the reed uh does it the uh for a string instrument you know you don't need a cavity so much. You'll still get a tone out of a string even without a resonant cavity, but a resonant cavity can change the frequency response and make it sound a lot better. Um, so most string instruments have one, violins and guitars and whatever. And for percussion instruments, a real percussion instrument will typically also have a resonant cavity because it alters the sound and makes it sound better. And of course you can go a long ways down the road with you know what what you count as an instrument. This is sort of my example of other. I, a bagpipe is technically probably a uh, 
guy, I don't know, woodwind instrument, but it's a bagpipe, it is whatever it is. Um, so let's just enjoy this for a moment. And you can see the resonant cavity, which is the bag of the bagpipe and also the tube in the flute. Um, the main thing is that tube in the, in the pipe. And uh, you can sort of see the resonance changed in that by changing which holes are covered. Um, of course, mostly you see cactus. All right, I think we've heard that. Um, and you adjust the pitch of an instrument typically for a guitar, right? You adjust the pitch by tension. If I uh, take this guitar string and turn this knob up on it, um, sorry, this knob up on it near the top, I can change what, um, how tight the string is and that turns out to change the, re the resonant frequency. There again, it's changing that spring constant that we talked about earlier. There, it's left it reasonably tuned. And so, you know, you can sort of see that as I went down in tension, the spring constant gets lower, the fundamental frequency gets lower, and there we are. Um, and like I say, for something like a clarinet or a bagpipe pipe, you know, we, we change the effective length of the resonant cavity by letting air out the holes in the middle. Um, in most natural instruments, right, are monophonic. The guitar is sort of not a natural instrument, you know, not a monophonic instrument, but only sort of, right? It's sort of six monophonic instruments placed close together and it's typical not to have a large number of tone generators in the same instrument and you know bagpipes and guitars and harps you know a few things like that pianos um and another sa source of natural sound that we're going to be concerned with a lot in this course is just the human voice and i say just it's kind of a miraculous thing it turns out that if you look at the human vocal tract, what you see is sort of down here, or, oh, sorry, let me make this bigger. The human vocal tract is sort of a, got these vocal folds. They're, they're, they're not actually chords, even though they're called vocal chords, that oscillate when air goes over them, so we have an air, a source of noise effectively, or excitation for these vi things, they vibrate. And then there's this big resonant cavity formed of your, you know, larynx and your mouth and your nose to some extent, your nasal cavity, that modifies the sound. And so voice is to some large degree a resonant phenomenon. It turns out that it's, you can vary the vocal fold a little bit mostly what you do when you change your voice is you modify the shape of this resonant cavity and that's what changes pitch so you know the voice people talk about the voice as an instrument and it's not it's uh it's it you know it's not classically so but looked at from this point of view from the point of view of what is an instrument well yeah we got a noise source we got a resonant cavity you know we've got the things that you know we've got an oscillator we've got the things that you typically see in any other instrument it's just that this instrument happens to be under direct brain control and we all have a lot of experience with it which is pretty amazing you know so as my mouth moves you can see the shapes right that i make with my mouth help determine what comes out and so something as simple as you know wah wah Wow, wow, right? You can hear the frequency components change. Wow, as I open my mouth wider and change the shape of that cavity. Um, it turns out that, you know, when I have my mouth mostly closed, high frequencies are muted. When I have my mouth mostly open, ah, then high frequencies come out really easily. And, you know, this is an interesting airment instrument because you could sort of guess what the range of human hearing frequencies is partly from being able to find out what the range of voice frequency looking you know looking at the range of voice frequencies oddly we can make most of the sounds we can hear and so i can go 
reasonably low. I can't get down to 60 hertz, but I can get down. And I can get up reasonably high. And of course, you know, women can go, or women, or people with small larynxes in general can go way higher than me. And, you know, we have this light, nice wide range that sort of corresponds to the human hearing range. So that's sort of sound in nature. Uh, and, you know, obviously there again, like most of the topics in this course, it's a very, very brief introduction and, you know, gives you a feeling. And, you know, why do I care about this, you know, in a computer sound and music course? Well, because we spend a lot of time trying to imitate these things trying to process these things, trying to record and play back sounds made by these things. And so understanding some principles of natural sound sources is great um, if you're gonna do any of those things. I hope this was useful. It was certainly fun to talk about. Hope everybody's staying safe out there and I will talk to you again very soon. Take care.